All right, folks, we're going to get going here uh, this morning. It is Wednesday, March 8th, 2023. It is now 8.33, and we have a full day with uh, a full slate of students here, which is just lovely. Um, our first bill this morning um, is going to be uh, presented by Senator Kupik. Senator Kupik, would you like to, oh, let's see. Let's see, who should we do this? Senator Westland, would you please make a, a motion to um, move Senate file 1297 uh, for possible inclusion? Madam Chair, I would like to move Senate file 1297 uh, for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you. Um, and welcome to our committee, Senator Kupik, if you would like to begin. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am proud here to be with Senate File uh, 1297, which is giving money for uh, intercurricular career technical student organizations, or also known as CTSOs, and an operating funding for the Minnesota Foundation of Student Organizations, which has another lovely acronym, which are MFSOs. Uh, the MFSO was created in 1996 to provide a collaborative leadership and stability to the career and technical organizations, CTSOs in Minnesota. Career technical organizations support rigorous academic content uh, of career and technical education programs. Uh, they also ensure students meet industry skills, standards, and are prepared for employment. They are also provide students with a comprehensive framework for leadership and employable skills and are thus an integral part of a CTE program. And at this time, when we are facing a severe shortage of workers, uh, particularly in the skilled trades, they provide a valuable tool uh, for that. CTOs uh, serve students in middle school, high school, and college, and they are made up of organizations uh, that I bet many of you were members of and hold dear, FFA, DECA, HOSA, and more. Uh, they have a combined membership of over 26,000 students and are integrated in more than 85% of CTE programs across the state with an estimated impact of more than 140,000 students. They also support Minnesota's economy by aligning the occupations most in demand, agriculture, health science, business marketing, family and consumer sciences and construction, manufacturing, transportation, technology, law enforcement, and more. And despite continued membership growth of CTSOs, they have never received a, an increase in funding, with the exception of FCCLA, nor has the MFSOs received uh, an increase in funding to support basic operations. So the bill today uh, would provide an increase in funding. So if we go through uh, section one, shows the appropriation, and then each appropriation is actually specifically broken down uh, by each member group. And then at the end, if there is any balance left over in the first year, uh, it is also available to hold over. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to bring forward a couple of testifiers. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Kupak. I just have one question. When you say they've never had an increase, since when? The last increase, I believe, was, actually, it's been. Um, and, and while you're looking, I let's look. have Emily Said and uh, Savani and the Carmour, uh, join us at the, the testifying table, and we'll begin in a minute. Uh, it's been 12 years. 12 years. Yes. Thank you so much. So, um, Emily Said, if you would like to um, state your name for the, for the record, and then you may begin. I'm Emily Said. I'm the director of the Minnesota Foundation for Student Organizations. Um, we're the, the MFSO actually has oversight of the career and technical student organizations. Um, and I'm just here today to talk about our, all of our awesome career and technical student organizations. And I will be brief because you can see we have actual experts, our students. Um, and this introduction was fantastic. It's actually half of my, my testimony here. So just very quickly, our student organizations are BPA, Business Professionals of America, which aligns with business, finance, education. Uh, DECA, which is marketing, but it also aligns with hospitality and tourism education. FCCLA, which aligns with family and consumer sciences and early childhood education. FFA, which aligns with agriculture, food, and natural resources, and HOSA, uh, which aligns with, uh, 
HOSA is the actual acronym, it's Health Occupation Students of America, and that aligns with Health Sciences and Health Technologies, and Skills USA, which aligns with technical and industrial trades, including engineering and manufacturing. Um, and again, uh, our student organizations are intercurricular. They're integrated into the classroom. Uh, they do provide actual technical skill assessments that were developed by industry. Uh, and a lot of times those will actually lead to certifications. So our students are prepared for the workforce. Our student organizations serve students in middle school, high school, and college. Um, they do, again, actively drive workforce development with those uh, skill assessments and um, creating actual measurements of technical skill attainment. And another unique piece of our career and technical student organizations, they host skill-based conferences, uh, and it allows students a chance to showcase their technical skills through competitive events, and those are actually judged by industry members, and a lot of times they're even hosted at industry facilities, um, and that can drive work-based learning opportunities. We're uh, an interesting linchpin to providing actual internships, apprenticeships, and other types of work-based learning. Um, and they also provide uh, service learning opportunities, which is kind of unique. Um, and the very last thing that I'd like to touch on today, uh, before again I turn it over to our experts, is our work with underserved and uh, marginalized, disenfranchised populations. Um, over a decade ago, we began intentionally identifying and addressing barriers to meaningful participation in our CTSOs. Um, we did that through kind of a, a, a twofold aspect. We um, looked at providing professional development opportunities, and we've been able to reach hundreds of career and technical education educators and administrators addressing poverty in the classroom and creating a more inclusive environment. Um, and we're also able to support individual CTSO um, programs that increased access and encouraged more diverse membership population. And one of the pieces that we're working on now and looking to continue to pursue is creating more diverse representation within the leadership. Um, so again, uh, I am available for technical questions about uh, the, the funding pieces and that sort of thing, but I would love for you to hear from our true experts. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Said. Uh, next, Anne, and Anda Kumar. Anand Kumar, you're very Anand close. Kumar, <laughs> thank you. Um, if you would please state your name for the record and then you may begin. Absolutely. First and foremost, I would like to thank you all for your time. My name is Savani Anand Kumar, and I'm currently a high school senior graduating in June, and I'm honored to have the privilege to speak to you all on behalf of Minnesota HOSA as the current vice president and board representative. Everyone's journey to healthcare is a bit different, and today I'd like to talk to you all about mine. I knew from a young age that I wanted to enter healthcare. However, as a first generation American with no connections or familial ties to healthcare, I was lost and didn't really know how to achieve this goal. Then, towards the end of my freshman year, I joined HOSA Future Health Professionals. In HOSA, I got the guidance and knowledge I otherwise needed to gain. HOSA Future Health Professionals is an international organization, the premier talent pipeline towards healthcare, and is 100% student-led at all levels. We provide our members conferences, competitions, mentorships, leadership opportunities, networking opportunities, a supportive community, and more. Our students have already begun saving lives in the real world. Within the last year, we've had students from Oklahoma save a salving victim not even 10 miles from our international conference and had a student talk to the president about mental health. All of this before our students have even graduated college. I also made connections to professionals who guided me in my healthcare disparities research, which is currently being used by clinical educators and clinic diversity training, and it's where I got my first job. It was through HOSA that I learned about an internship with a prominent women's health organization, and I'm using that knowledge gained from the internship to make a proposal to my school board to ensure free menstrual products for our students in the district. It was during these internships and projects that my passion for women's health was awoken. I learned that we currently have a national shortage of 8,000 OBGYNs as of right now, which is estimated to surpass 22,000 by 2050. As a woman and just a member of our society, 
It's terrifying to know that half our population can't get the care that they deserve. Like me, HOSA has helped students find, recognize, and foster their passions in a safe and supportive community, which is especially crucial when Minnesota specifically is experiencing a 26.7% increase in the need for healthcare professionals from 2020 to 2030, with over 372,668 total job openings needing to be filled, much greater than any other occupation. And while our students have already begun bridging this gap in care, we need more resources and funding to ensure that we can continue to enter the field. HOSA truly molds the health of tomorrow. And to ensure that our lives and our future generations' lives are safe, we need to invest in our future medical leaders. So I humbly ask you all to support this bill so we can continue to provide our members the best resources and education possible so that we may in turn provide you the best care. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. Well, well spoken, and I uh, appreciate your um, advocacy for women um, in our state who obviously are not receiving the care that they need. So thank you very much. Next we have uh, Caleb Jarvis and Caden Johnson, if you would come to the, to the um, testifying table. And Caleb, when you're ready, you may state your name, your full name for the record, and you may begin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Caleb Jarvis, and I'm the president of Minnesota DECA. When I came into high school, I struggled with being shy, quiet, and had an overall lack of confidence. I remember my freshman year when I had to give a presentation in front of my class of 30 people, and I was mortified. Through my time in DECA, I have come to grow my social, public speaking, and communication skills to a point I would have never thought imaginable. It is through not only DECA as well as CTSO opportunities that these previously unimaginable opportunities have become a reality. For those of you who may not know, DECA is a business and marketing competition organization that offers its members the opportunity to compete in a, variety of, in a various different type of events in the business, marketing, finance, and hospitality based competitive events. One thing that I personally love about DECA is the variety that it offers to its members. Our members have the opportunity to compete in anything from a sales demonstration, where they give a sales pitch to a judge with an item of their choice, to a community awareness campaign project. In a community awareness campaign project, members can expect to create an awareness campaign centered around an issue in their own community, as well as provide the rationale for the completion of said campaign. When I began my awareness campaign, I looked to my community to attempt to identify potential issues, and one major problem stood out, the opioid crisis. Through this opportunity to present, presented to me by DECA, I successfully ran a fentanyl awareness campaign over the course of the last five months, through the use of fentanyl awareness events as well as student involvement days at my local high school, and I am extremely proud of the outcome. However, it must be said that I would have never had such an opportunity to perform service in my community had it not been for DECA as well as CTSO opportunities. Thank you for listening. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Caden. If you would like to state your name for the record, and you may begin your testimony. My name is Caden Johnson, and I am serving as the state reporter for FFA this year. Thank you for having the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I'm representing Minnesota FFA with nearly 16,000 FFA members. I'm a graduate of Fertile Beltrami High School in Polk County and career and technical education and the Minnesota FFA Association played a major role in shaping me into the leader and the person that I am today. As a non-traditional student from Fertile, Minnesota, I was surrounded by agriculture and yet I had no experience and little understanding within it. Had it not been for my required intro to agriculture course in the seventh grade, I would not have had the opportunity to learn about and explore the diversity within the agricultural industry, and I would never have set my sights on the blue jacket that we see here today. While I was excited to learn more about agriculture, I was most interested in the leadership opportunities that FFA provided. As soon as I had the chance, I signed up to be my Parliamentary Procedures Team President, an FFA Creed Speaking Competitor, and a Chapter Officer. Whether it's Parliamentary Procedure, Public Speaking, or Teamwork, FFA provides students with necessary leadership skills that they need to succeed. 
Not only did FFA allow me to develop leadership, it also provided opportunities for career exploration and success. Our association is providing students with the skills and experiences that they need to succeed in any and all careers. We are future agriculturalists, but we are also future teachers, doctors, entrepreneurs, and even future legislators and more. FFA has supported my socio-emotional development, and FFA allowed me to form a passion for rural mental health, which is why I'm attending school to become a psychiatrist and give back to the rural communities that have already given me so much. Student leaders, such as myself, lead these student organizations. On Friday, I'll be facilitating a leadership development conference for middle and high school students alongside my team. We have been able to reach even more students thanks to the Minnesota Foundation for Student Organizations Disadvantaged, Disadvantaged Population Grants, which remove financial barriers to attending leadership conferences like ours. With nearly 40% of our students qualifying for free and reduced lunch, it is vital that the Minnesota Foundation for Student Organizations continue to fund our student organizations as we apply what we learn in our classrooms and prepare for our future careers and lives as citizens. FFA unites students, traditional and non-traditional students alike, and truly does develop their leadership, personal growth, and career success. Your support for the Minnesota Foundation for Student Organization allows FFA to create leaders in any career that they may choose. When you support the Minnesota Foundation for Student Organizations, you are supporting the future. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your testimony. Uh, next we have uh, Levin Reda. you would introduce yourself with your full name and you may begin. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Lavin Rada, and I am representing the Minnesota Association of Career and Technical Educators. I also serve on the board for the Minnesota Foundation for Student Organizations, and I'm the director for the teacher induction program for our career and technical educators. I'm here in great support of this legislation. Um, every single student you have heard from and over 100,000 students in Minnesota all begin in a classroom, a career and technical education classroom. And these organizations allow our students to apply the skills that they learn in their classroom, take the skills that they learn in work experience, and apply them in a competitive um, arena to prepare them for their future. So on behalf of all of our career and technical education teachers across the state of Minnesota, please support this bill and continue investing in our youth. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much and uh, appreciate the work that you do with our youth and getting them ready for the future in the way that you do. Um, Senator Kupik, our members, any questions, comments, thoughts? Well, I just want to thank you and thank all the students that came in and for these programs that are building um, self-confidence, global awareness, uh, leadership skills, entrepreneurial, uh, you know, investments. Uh, really, really appreciate it. So with that, Senator Kupik, if you have any final words? Uh, only, you know, I think... I don't think I can say anything better than the uh, testifiers who came here before. I think they're prime examples uh, of the good that this program has done and will continue to do into the future. Thank you so much. With that, um, Senator Wesslin renews her uh, motion to lay Senate file 1297 over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Senator Swadzinski. Senator Swadzinski, would you like to make a motion to, uh, let's see, this thing later on. Yeah. Uh, make a motion to lay Senate file 2383 over for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill? Yes, I would. And I have the A1 amendment, okay. Madam Chair. Wonderful. So would you please present us your A1 amendment? The A1 amendment just changes a couple technical things on, in the bill. It's, 
couple words and here and there. Okay. Any questions, members? All right. Well, let's accept that motion to for A1. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. So, so you may begin with your, uh, your bill and bring your testifiers up when we're ready. Well, it's great to see so many young people here today. I just want to applaud all of you um, that are here today, and um, it's, it's wonderful to see. And uh, about five or six years ago, a, a few young um, high school students came to me, talking to me about menstrual equity. And I listened to them at that meeting, and I thought, oh my God, here are these young people that are trying to leave this world a better place, and they're making all these um, interesting insights, and they're talking to this you know, 60 year old person, and they're filled with enthusiasm and exuberance and, um, and, and vigor, and, um, and I was overwhelmed with joy over such passion for their beliefs and their cause. And it looks like perhaps this year, after four or five years there, that bill will, may become law. I felt that way a couple weeks ago when in my office, five students, and I think a few of them are here today, came to my office with this, a similar idea. Um, well, not similar idea, but a, a, an, a, an idea that um, um, came to fruition among a, in bunch, a bunch of high school students in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. And so what this bill does is it just creates funding for after-school programs, which are generally the first programs to be cut when budget cuts occur. And uh, anybody that spent time in, in a school after school gets out in the traditional cells and bells of the day, and everybody scatters, and a lot of kids are looking around for something to do because they're not athletes, they're not in um, other traditional extracurricular activities. And after school events have been proven, and, 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 and I don't need data on this, I know anecdotally that students that go to a place after the school to, in the building that is, was created to just try to make the school a little bit smaller of a place, and they could find their niche in the building, improves students' mental health and increases um, student engagement and civic engagement, and, and ultimately one of our goals, I think, this session for all of us is um, the huge alcohol and substance abuse um, that's taking place among our youth. And I think um, kids that are involved in after school activities have something constructive to do at the end of the day. And if we don't give our kids something yeah. constructive to do, many of them find things destructive to do. And so I'm a huge fan of after school programs. I've got a number of testifiers here today that want to tell you about their after school programs. And um, so let's begin. Wonderful. Um, first on our list is Emma Bradford and then Kaya Grossman. Are they here? And um, girls, if you could keep your testimony to about two minutes, that would be great. We have a long line of folks that want to speak. Come on up. So Emma, if you would state your full name for the record and you may begin. Hi, my name is Emma Brayford and we are a part of the Minnesota United Student Coalition. Kaya, Isaac, and I are all also members of the Grand Rapids FFA chapter and we, go, we are also 11th graders at the Grand Rapids High School. And a couple years ago I started working on this project with a high school from the cities, HSRA, the High School for Recording Arts, and we have uh, decided to work on this issue pertaining to substance abuse that we have found within our schools and across schools in both urban and rural Minnesota. And we have determined due to research that we have conducted that providing after school programming in eight pilot schools is going to present us with uh, both uh, with information that we can use to determine that after school programming is going to reduce uh, substance abuse and mental health issues in schools. And we have decided to take a kindergarten through 12th grade comprehensive approach, seeing as research shows that students not involved in after school programs are more likely to get involved with substance use and being involved uh, at an early age with these programs is going to help, uh, help guide them down the correct path early on. And oftentimes by the time students reach the high school level and they have not yet had access to these after school programs, 
uh, it is too late. And sometimes they're already going down that path of poor mental health or uh, substance use or substance abuse. And we believe that it is a better to tackle the root of the issue rather than uh, treating the symptoms of the issue, which is oftentimes a more uh, costly, uh, costly way of going about things. And by providing schools, uh, by researching, we have found that by providing schools with funding that covers meals, transportations, and other costs of after-school programs, we are giving students across both urban and rural Minnesota a chance to be a part of something that they may otherwise have never had the opportunity for. And we have found through re research that young people who engage in after-school programs just two times a week are 20% less likely to use alcohol and 40% like less likely to use marijuana than their peers. Students reported also on a survey taken when they were 12 to 14 years old, higher levels of school engagement, and reported statistically significant lower uses of alcohol and cannabis usage when surveyed again at ages 15 through 19. And we have also found that interactive peer-to-peer -peer group sessions are effective both in prevention and to support recovery when peers leading, are leading those groups uh, and have had both training and support. And that is one thing that we stand firm in, is our beliefs that students should be behind uh, the decisions made in their schools, in the school districts chosen for these eight pilot programs, seeing as the students should have a voice as they know what issues are going on in their school behind the scenes. They're there in person and they see what's going on. And so I would like to thank you for having me here and that is my testimony. Thank you so much, Miss um, um, Brickford. I uh, appreciate the work that you've done and all the research that you've done on this issue. Um, and then we have Kaya Grossman. Would you state your name for the record and you may begin. Yep. Um, my name is Kaya Grossman. I'm an 11th grader at the Grand Rapids High School, which is located in greater Minnesota, about far enough away for us to leave at 3.30 this morning to get here. Um, so I know some of you guys are teachers, retired teachers, or some of you have kids. So I feel like this is something you guys can really kind of have a deeper understanding of. Um, this bill is all about being preventative versus reactive. We want to take care of the children for their first 18 years versus for 60 years. Um, we want to invest money in these people now rather than later, and we want to treat the symptoms rather than tackle the root of an issue. Right now in Minnesota, approximately 328,504 Minnesota students are not involved in programs like athletics, FFA, Boys and Girls Club, etc. For all of these students to be in this program, it would cost around $532 million per year for all of these students to be in the program. So, um, also, in Minnesota, there are 786,000 Minnesotans doing illicit drugs and 234,000 abuse alcohol in a given year. Um, for one of these people to receive treatment, it would come out at about 34,000 a year, which is a lot of money for one of these people to be receiving treatment. We would only have to save 11% of these students in our program for the state to run equal on the costs. So this program does make a big impact on the amount that the state would be spending. And we believe that the long-term effects of giving students an opportunity to participate, be a leader, and to give students a place to find their passion is remarkable. And not every student has a way to give this opportunity to their students. Um, I recently saw a quote by Martin Luther King that really inspired me, and it's one of the big reasons that I started working really heavily on this bill, and it's, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggles. This means that change lies in changing the norms, as well as summoning our determination and courage to stand up in the face of adversity and persist in making a difference. This is how I am making my difference and giving students the opportunities that I have. This is how we are making a difference as high school students in today's world. Use me as an example, a 16-year-old talking at a community hearing. None of this is possible if I didn't join FFA. That is my program that I participate in. Um, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have someone to look up to and show me the opportunities that I had. And my FFA advisor um, really opened the door to a world of opportunities. Um, with all of that, I ask for your support on this bill, and thank you for letting us come and testify. Thank you for sharing that with, you, with us. Um, next, we have Isaac Palachek and Savannah Moynichin. 
Uh, if you would like to join us at the table. Savannah is uh, actually not present today. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. Then we have Jason Anderson. Is Jason here? Okay. Come on up to the testifying table and... Isaac, if you would please state your full name and then you may begin. Hello, I am Isaac Palachek. I am also an 11th grader at Grand Rapids High School. I am heavily involved in our FFA chapter. I am the chapter sentinel and I am also the captain of the swim team at Grand Rapids High School. So I first got involved with this coalition when my FFA advisor introduced it to me, believing that I would be a help to this organization. I believe that mental health and drug abuse in teens should be at the top of our priority in Minnesota. I have seen some of my closest friends fall apart just because they don't have anything to do after school and no one to hold them accountable. Purpose is what fuels good choices and high self-esteem. As I've grown up in my community, I have always struggled to find my people and my group. As a young kid, I joined the swim team, and even now, some of my closest friends come from that time in my life. Then, as a freshman in high school, I got in with the wrong crowd, searching for an identity that I had never had. But it was the wrong identity, and it was not healthy for me. And I joined FFA, and FFA gave me a group of people that I related to, and gave me a purpose and a strong self-worth. I believe that every kid needs a purpose to have a strong self-esteem. I believe involvement in a club or activity will give our students the ability to explore themselves and find their passion. I believe that every student needs a mentor in their life. If it doesn't come from a parent, it needs to come from a teacher or someone else in their life. Kids make bad choices when they have nothing to do and nothing to lose. We need to give students a passion and a commitment that they enjoy so that they can make their own decisions based off of their own health and reputation. Having adults and peers in our lives who hold us accountable is what prevents us from making those poor choices. It's not a two-day suspension and shame in our school. That doesn't stop us from making bad decisions. It's what, it's making people that we respect Disappointed is what prevents us from making bad decisions, and that's what I believe we need to promote in our communities. So thank you for hearing my testimony, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much for coming and joining us here this morning. Uh, next we have Jason Anderson. Please state your name for the record, and you may begin. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Jason Anderson. I am the driver at 0330 this morning, and I'm an FFA alumni and uh, proud parent of FFA members. Um, I, I'm here to testify in support of this bill. I think this is, this is fantastic innovation. Um, I, I would echo many of the sentiments of the, the previous testifiers, and I would also reinforce that um, prevention, the whole notion of being upstream, we're mindful of, of the countless risk factors that our youth are exposed to, and we could, we could celebrate them and, and talk about these terrible, awful risk factors or we could look at what are, the, what are the, the resiliency factors? What can we do to offset risk factors? The research is abundantly clear there that the strongest thing we can do is introduce a pro-social adult in a kid's life that's not a parent. It trumps almost everything. So how do you do that? How do you introduce this pro-social adult into a kid's lives? What, what this bill contemplates serves to help accomplish that. You create mentors, you create coaches, um, FFA advisors, business professionals of America, tutors, and, and community, uh, community, community members that show an interest, that take, that take a part in your life and, 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 and model to you what to do and how to be. Um, this legislation is an effort to, to accomplish that. So um, I, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your, your willingness to, to hear um, our testimony. I also want to express support in the, uh, for the bill previous to this, uh, this bill, because I think that's outstanding stuff as well. So thank you, Madam Chair and, and committee members. Thanks so much, Mr. Anderson. Appreciate that. Next, we have em uh, Emery Lilly and Carnitha Hurd. Are you here? Okay, come on up. And then we have Haben, and I'm sorry, I'm just not. Haben? 
Thank you. Carnitha, if you would please uh, state your name, your full name, and then you may begin. So um, if I could, em Emery's here, and if oh, I could, I'm possibly, sorry. If I could possibly go first to switch the order just so it'll kind of clarify sure. and provide some context. All right, cool. So my name is Haben. Good morning, everyone. And I'm a lead uh, teacher at the High School for Recording Arts in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I've had the pleasure of working with these wonderful uh, people from Grand Rapids for about the last year or two um, on helping expand after school programming. For a little bit of context, my high school um, serves about 260 students, most of whom are behind on credits and have had some type of disruption to their learning and indeed their lives. So, you know, 86% qualify for free and reduced lunch, about 50% experience homelessness at some point through the year, and only 5 to 10% live in traditional two-parent households. And on average, students uh, at our school have been to four different high schools before they get to us. Um, HSRA has had the pleasure of hosting an after-school program called Get It Right um, that's been funded partially through Ramsey County. It's open Monday through Friday, 4.45 to 7.45, about 20 minutes after the school day is over. That's when the program starts. Um, and I've had the pleasure of being able to be a tutor, working on recruitment for the program, ensuring students access their services, and also organizing um, field trips that build a sense of... Um, uh, teamwork and uh, community building with the students. Uh, the program provides unique services that aren't met by, met by the regular school program. It serves students who can't attend during the day um, and thus prevents them from dropping out of school. And we know that staying in school is critical to building not only economic viability, but also a sense of self-worth. Um, students also get free one-on-one -on -one tutoring to build academic confidence and catch up on their classes. And it also allows students a space to work on their passions. Our projects, dancing, making music, sports. Some of you might have remembered um, seeing myself and a cohort of students last week testifying on another bill. Those students were part of the after school programming. So in that instance, they got a chance to learn the political process, uh, being able to see testimonies and uh, be exposed to things that they haven't been uh, previously exposed to. Um, and finally, it just gives students a safe space at night to be productive, to be cared for, to be fed, and just to be a kid. That's something a lot of our students uh, lose out out. They have to go lose out on. They have to grow very quickly. And I've seen how these programs have positively influenced students who might otherwise get into more negative things. We get about 30 students a night, and so I'm I'm a big fan of a uh, big proponent of this bill, and I hope that you will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haben. And then um, Emery, would you please state your name for the record, and then you may begin. Uh, hello, my name is Emery Lilly. Um, I'm one of many of the students at HSRA and, oh my God, at HSRA High School for Recording Arts. And I'm here to talk about why the after school program is, in, is an important part of our school. For some of our students, the after school program is their safe place, somewhere to get away from home drama or just to have something productive and creative to do. Somewhere you could have fun with friends, go on meaningful field trips, and have a meal at the end of the day. Some of our students, as Ms. Hobbin stated, only go to our after school program because they can't attend during normal hours, either do work or because of family, anxiety, all of those things. The after school program provides a safe, calm, and fun interactive place for students that can have a positive impact. I've seen it, and it can really help with mental health and even just having somewhere to go for those times to just have something good to do and something other than being outside and getting into all that trouble. Thank you, and I am done. Oh my gosh, that was horrible. I did, I did not go. Thank you, Mr. Lilly. I, I appreciate hearing your voice. It's, it's, uh, it's w the one thing that I like about um, this this bill and the testifiers here is that we're hearing from you know our urban core, from our rural core, um, and really appreciate the voices of our students uh, and the recognition um, that sometimes adults don't advocate for our kids in the best way. And when you bring these sort of uh, bills forward and when you put your voice to these pieces of legislation, I think it really does carry a lot of credence. Um, I thank you for, for the organization of this bill. I know you put a lot of time and effort and thought into it and appreciate you joining us here at the state legislature to also voice your, your opinion and advocate for others as well. So. 
Uh, with that, I think we are done with testifiers. Was there anyone else out there that wished to testify? All right. Then members, any, que any questions or comments? Uh, Senator Kruin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, great testimony I, uh, from uh, the students in particular. Um, I'm a big believer in extracurricular activities, co-curricular activities. Um, somebody who played, I played sports, varsity sports in high school, and one thing I noticed is that um, when you grow up in a, a smaller school, the opportunities to play varsity sports uh, Minnesota State High School League sanctioned sports is um, a little bit easier than when you come down into the Twin Cities and, um, you know, there may be 10 spots on the varsity basketball team and, you know, 100 kids trying out to get it. And then so the question is, what do you do with the kids that don't make those teams and what offerings do we have because there's so many life skills and things of that nature that go along with playing in those activities, being a part of a team, teamwork, et cetera. So I'm a big um, believer in, in, in these types of endeavors. My question is, I, I guess, is uh, with these grant programs, what uh, is this, does this go towards interest groups, uh, club sports, or does it go towards uh, Minnesota State High School League sanctioned sports? Could you just kind of break down kind of what, what exactly the, uh, the grant program with the offerings that it goes towards yeah thank you senator I'm um, I'm just gonna read verbatim to answer your question I wish I could had it off the cuff but grants must be awarded in proportion to the number of students enrolled and be made available for a five-year period with equal amounts distributed each year grant May, grants may be used to pay for the cost of students participating in extracurricular activities, meals, transportation, stu student participation planning, um, and to evaluate the effectiveness of the program. And Mr. Kroon, could I, or Senator Kroon, um, maybe um, Emma and Kaya, would you please, would, do, Emma, do you want to come up and just explain a little bit about your vision for this bill so that we can understand it a little bit better? That's thank a, you. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's an awesome idea. And um, members and audience, I, I think it's important to remember that um, Emma and her team are the ones that brought this to us. They have spent two years yep. uh, working on this uh, piece of legislation and have done a lot of research, have a lot of data behind it, and so this is um, not coming from our legislators, but this is coming from these students uh, through their lens. And um, so we're providing this opportunity for them to share it with us. And if we need to fine tune it along the way, um, that's sort of our, our, uh, our vision. So go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our vision as the Minnesota United Student Coalition is that these grant programs, uh, these grants would be appropriated out to school districts. And within those school districts, it is uh, written in the bill that those school districts will have been determined based off of if they already premier student leadership. And the programs that they decide to uh, invest the money into are going to be decided by a student voice in their school district, seeing as those students already know uh, what their school district needs, and they will be able to better determine than we are as a group of uh, students from two high schools that aren't in their school district. Uh, they'll be better able to determine what their high school needs, and it might go to programs such as the Boys and Girls Club. It might go uh, be distributed out to programs such as uh, Scouts of America or sports teams or after school activities that uh, such as HSRA has and we have uh, determined that the cost of an after school program uh, such as any of these programs averages out to cost about $1,620 a year per student in the program uh, so we believe that by having eight pilot schools four in urban Minnesota and four in rural Minnesota uh, receive funding based off of their school size 
uh, and receive a different amount of funding based off of their school size for different numbers of students in their school, then we will be able to reach a diverse amount of students from across the state. So we plan that we, another requirement for uh, becoming part of our program would be that two of the schools in the seven county metropolitan area of the state would have a average class size of 50 to 100 students and 500 students, they would be given uh, the money for uh, 500 students to participate, to be able to have our program. Uh, and then the other two schools in that area have an average class size of 250 to 300 students and they can have up to 1,000 students. And then the same goes for the four, the two schools and two schools or two school districts or charter schools and two school districts or charter schools in the rural areas of Minnesota. Is there anything else I can clarify? Mr. Cruen, Senator Cruen. Good Lord. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and, and thank you for that response. So uh, what I'm hearing is kind of, uh, it, it's set up to provide some flexibility on a school by school basis to address the needs that um, are in that school in the interests, I guess, of the students that are in that school, so it's not kind of a one-size-fits-all approach grant. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I do appreciate that, um, and I think that's a, um, a good model um, to set up um, whenever we at the state level seek to you know, endeavor to um, engage in programs like this, is to keep that kind of local focus in mind um, in, in what the... Uh, that those schools and those students in those schools might be interested and might need. Um, the only comment I would, would offer is that, um, again, I, I, I'm sounding like a broken record when I talk about, um, it's, it's just my frame of reference when I just got off the school board um, at the end of the last calendar year. And this was a, it was a big priority of, 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 I'll speak for myself on the school board, um, um, as I mentioned before, how do you address the needs of the students that maybe don't make that varsity team in sports, but they're still interested? Or maybe they're not athletes at all, and they have different interests, and there's all sorts of things. So I just counted, we, in, in our school district, we have 41 club sports and interest group offerings in our school district, 41. And that doesn't count the Minnesota State High School League sanctioned boys and girls sports. So I don't know what those numbers are, but we're probably well over 60 different offerings for students. And it seems like that maybe is what this gets at. I do know there's a lot of districts that are already doing this work. And, and my focus on the school board was even to bring that down to the middle school level and, uh, and not just focus on high school and some of these uh, kids that, you know, because at the middle school level, you're talking about traveling teams, traveling basketball, hockey, et cetera, and those are a whole different world sometimes. And, and um, it seems like we've moved away from some more of these rec middle school programs. So that was a big focus of mine as well. I guess where I struggle a little bit is we were doing all these things without state grants. Uh, we prioritized them on the school board and we invested in those things. And so I don't wanna discourage schools districts from independently addressing these needs and really focusing on investing in these interest groups and, and club sports because there's a grant out there that they're chasing. That's my only concern, but I think you've done some really good work and you've hit on some really important issues and I thank you for coming today and testifying. Thank, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Senator, uh, Senator Maykwaite. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I think this actually, this question might be for the testifier. Um, I went to Eastview High School. I was in swimming and softball, but I was in choir. Um, we have a really robust robotics team. Could these uh, funds also cover travel and meals for things that aren't sports, but maybe debate, speech, um, FCCLA, robotics, so on and so forth? Um, um, Ms. Bradford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, these, uh, the funding would be provided to any after-school activities, not uh, just not strictly sports. Uh, it is simply to increase uh, the funding in programs uh, that are already existing, uh, and that could consist of maybe a robotics team or debate team, or uh, we've mentioned Boys and Girls Club, which is on the uh, more elementary and middle school level, 
And uh, so yes, to answer your question, yes, it would include those as well. Follow up? Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. And I, I just think it's really important that we acknowledge that there's a lot of different things to do after schools that aren't necessarily sports. I was a very mediocre athlete. Uh, made varsity, but I you know, wasn't the captain. Um, my last question would be um, related to um, the funding that you know school districts might already be having, but obviously there's a gap there. Can you talk a little bit about what that gap has meant? Like, because we don't have this money, what is what's happening? We go me. ahead, Ms. Brayford. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have actually seen this even within Grand Rapids with our local boys and girls club. They are actually running out of. Uh, they don't have the funds to uh, keep their lease for the building that they are currently using. Uh, seeing as they are using an old elementary school that will, uh, will be demolished soon. And because they don't have the funding, they, uh, I was just there uh, working like through FFA to educate some of the students in the Boys and Girls Club about uh, vegetables, unique vegetables. Um, and we saw that day as an FFA chapter, we saw 140 uh, students from ages from kindergarten through uh, seventh grade. Uh, but seeing as they are losing the funding that uh, they need for space, they're not able to have as many students anymore, so their numbers uh, coming up here soon are going to have to drop below uh, maybe even 100 students. And so we are experiencing this uh, issue in Grand Rapids, and I'm sure that we're experiencing it with many other after-school uh, events across the state because uh, they just don't have the, spot, the funding for the space that they need, or they may not have the funding for the transportation to get students home, or uh, especially since parents may not be able to drive their uh, kids home. Uh, so by providing the funding for that transportation, we would also be uh, allowing students who wouldn't have been able to before participate in these after-school programs to be able to participate in those programs. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I just think that there's so often we make decisions about students without students, and this gives us a really important opportunity to make a decision about students with students. And I want to thank you for your work in bringing this bill forward, and Senator Sosinski for your strong partnership with students. Mm -hmm. Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I want to welcome the folks from Grand Rapids. Uh, I feel your pain. I, most Monday mornings I leave Hibbing, not quite at 3.30, but I leave Hibbing fairly early to get here. Uh, so welcome here from the Northland. Um, so when I think about, so I've been a teacher in Hibbing for years, and when I think about programs like this or when I think about sports, participation has been plummeting over the years, and the reality is it's difficult to uh, compete with video games. I mean, we have kids, they, you know, they go home, they'd rather play video games than participate in, in some of these activities. And so my, I guess my concern with the, pro I think this is a good program. It, it has noble aspirations. My concern is that we're going to provide funding that's gonna be used for kids that are already participating in the program. And so I guess my question is in your vision, you know, this, it's not laid out in the bill, but in your vision for this, is there some component to try and encourage kids to increase participation? Um, because again, I, I, would, I would like to see increased participation in these programs, but I think the last thing anybody would wanna see is that this just goes to the kids that are already participating. You know, we wanna see that sort of growth. So, Sorry, long question. Is there a component to try and increase participation in these activities? Ms. Brayford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, overall, we have not uh, been able to consider many ways that schools in themselves can tackle that issue of how they will promote these after-school activities, but it will be largely up to the student leaders in those schools who are deciding upon which activities will be uh, handled in their school. Different schools might have different issues that they face when it comes to uh, participation in after-school activities, and that is um, something that each individual school will have to focus on for themselves and for the greater good of their own school. Uh, but there, uh, we do believe, though, that by having this funding and by speaking up and advocating for uh, the fact that many students in after are not participating in after school activities and by advocating for the positive benefits of participating in those activities we believe that maybe this will raise awareness to parents or of those students uh the 40 percent of students the average 40 percent who are not participating in after school activities and it may encourage parents uh, seeing as they have uh, the funding in a school to be able to send their kid to these after school programs it may, might encourage the parents to push the students to join these after-school programs. And 
really it does start with the parents. Uh, I see it all the time that students in my school don't can't participate in an activity because their parents never really introduced them to the idea of participating in an activity. So we believe that uh, by promoting the benefits of this program, uh, by having this bill and by granting these funds, uh, parents may be more susceptible to push their students to join these because it will be easier for their parents to put them in these after school activities. And Senator, if you ever have an idea for a bill that would get kids off the couch and stay in school a little longer than three o'clock, whatever the average time, um, let's work together on that issue because it's, it's, um, it is bordering on a crisis. Let's get these kids involved. Senator Farnsworth. Um, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the answer. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I guess so. This so there's a component to collecting research, and you know, um, I would just say, um, sort of to touch on uh, what Senator Suzinski said, I would maybe have something that would have some sort of a recruiting or some sort of a component to try and attract more kids as part of this as part of this program. I'm certainly not not opposed to this, but I just think we would want if we're going to do something like this, we would want to increase participation beyond kids that are already participating. Um, so, but again, thank you for coming down and testifying. Thank you, Senator. And um, with that, uh, I want to say thank you so much for bringing this forward and for your ability to speak to the bill that is a huge, huge uh, talent and skill. And we do appreciate you and all that came here. So with that, Senator Swadzinski, any final words? I, I just want to say, oh, sorry. Um, I think today and among all these young people that have testified, we're probably seeing a future legislator in the audience <laughs> today. And I'm sitting here today going, how old are you? Because <laughs> they're just so wise beyond their years. And um, so I think as um, Senator May Quay said, it's, it's nice that maybe we listen to them a little bit this session and in the coming years. And because uh, maybe we forgot to, to listen to the kids. And anything else I would add, I just want to echo what um, Senator Kupek said when he said, um, I can't add to anything these young people have said today. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. So with that, Senator Swadzinski renews his motion uh, to lay over Senate File 2383. Next, we have Senator Zhang. Please join us. Thank you for your patience. And Senator May Quaid, would you please uh, make a motion for S Senate File 1855? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Zhang, would you please present your testimony to, or uh, your bill to us? <laughs> good, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, I have before you Senate File uh, 1855. Uh, this is a bill asking the committee support to increase uh, financial resources for adult Basic, basic education providers across the state to serve our adult learners. Uh, while it is true that ABE, ABE providers provide basic skills and English language learning, uh, services can expand beyond quote unquote basic when providers have the resources. Adult education serves the needs of individuals, employers, and the workforce challenges that are facing our state. Nearly one in five Minnesotans over age 25 uh, do not have a high school diploma, and many who do still lack the basic skills necessary uh, for employment. ABE, ABE connects these adults to the skills, support, and opportunity they need to uh, gain stability and self-sufficiency. Of the 3.3 million working, adult, uh, working age adults in Minnesota, around 830,000 have some college but not have uh, completed a degree or credential. 48% uh, still requiring remedial reading or math. Uh, 890,000 have completed high school but not entered college. Uh, 346,000 earn less than a living wage. Uh, twice the poverty level of $11,000 for individuals and $24,000 for a family of four. Uh, ABE provides a variety of services, high school equi equivalency options, including GED and adult diploma classes, English language learning, post-secondary education preparation, 
uh, career pathways, workplace skill preparation, family literacy, citizenship, basic uh, skills enhancement, and digital learning. Services are delivered at 300 sites across the state. Um, there are great programs who have developed uh, career pathways for adults, uh, adult learners that are critical in their communities and for our state economy. Uh, my hope is that we will provide resources to allow additional programs to provide similar opportunities and importantly to allow for wage increases for our adult education teachers. Uh, my bill contains uh, two components. Uh, first, it adds an additional option to grow uh, ABE revenue by the growth in general education basic allowance. Uh, for years, ABE have been left out of funding increases when ad we addressed the needs of our K through 12 students. Uh, yet, educated adults are also still a critical uh, portion, and it's critical in assisting our K through 12 learners. Um, Second, the bill increases the maximum contract hour rate uh, from $22 to $30 per year, which will help our struggling smallest and rural programs who are burdened by this cap, particularly uh, in the last couple of years. And so uh, with me, uh, there are testifiers uh, that will speak to the funding need and increasing the cap. Uh, I think uh, first is uh, Scott. Helland. Thank you, um, Senator. So we'll call Scott Helland up to the testifying table and Clarice Grabo. Are you here also? If you would join us. And then we'll bring Erin um, Goodsey after they have completed their testimony. So, Mr. Helland, if you would state your full name for the record and you may begin. My name is Scott Helland. Uh, Madam Chair Kanesh and committee members, Senator Young, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I'm a member of the Literacy Action Network and a coordinator in adult education. Literacy Action Network is a statewide professional membership organization whose mission is to develop, improve, and expand adult literacy services by fostering statewide collaboration, facilitating professional development, and supporting quality adult basic ed. This bill recognizes the professionalism and hard work of teachers in our, in our field of adult education. Adult education services help students, but they also help families. A few years ago, we had uh, two students who were married and working towards their GED. While they were studying, their eighth grade son was failing math. Uh, both the mother and father earned their GED. Mom's a nurse now, dad's an iron worker, son's now a St. Paul policeman. ABE works for the whole family. 83% uh, of the adult education budget in the metro area is currently wages and salaries. Adult education programs run year round. Um, SF 1855 addresses these needs in adult education. Uh, the first point in, in tying adult education to K-12 funding helps to recognize the rising costs of wages and technology as the system works with adults to reach their goals. Adult education programs are focused on serving the needs of students to include, as, as Senator Jung talked about, English, GD, high set, certified nursing assistants, IT career focus, Paraprofessional training for schools. Uh, K-12 schools are, are desperate right now to get paras into the schools and, and adult ed is helping with, with uh, training some of the folks to, to rise into those roles. Jobs in manufacturing transportation. And uh, citizenship classes are an opportunity for immigrants to, to join even further with their community, state, and, and country. Uh, the second piece is at no cost to this legislature as it reallocates funds within the current system. It raises a cap that was established in 2002 from $22 per contact hour to $30 per contact hour. It's vitally important to adult education across the state of Minnesota as programs in greater Minnesota are, are more affected by this than others. Uh, and, and that's because in greater Minnesota it can be harder to aggregate students into a class. Class sizes are smaller uh, than in the metro area and why it affects them at a higher rate. Thank you for supporting adult education, which works with students on their education and entry or movement in the workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helland. Um, and now we'll hear from Ms. Um, Grabo, if you would state your full name for the record and you may begin. Good morning, Madam Chair and everyone here, and thank you for your service. My name is Clarice Graybaugh, and I am an ABE teacher in Northfield. I work with adults who are seeking a high school credential 
are learning the English language or need help with basic literacy skills in order to fully participate in society. I'm here today to ask you to support a much needed increase in funding. Minnesota ABE is nationally recognized for its outcomes. It helps remove barriers, reduce education gaps, and is a critical partner in helping all Minnesotans achieve economic and social mobility. With its innovative and responsive programming and its ability to adapt quickly to local needs, ABE is in a unique position to help address some of our state's most pressing needs, helping to break cycles of poverty, increase employment, earnings, and opportunities for all Minnesotans. So who are our students? ABE students are folks who've had their educational journey interrupted because they've experienced some sort of trauma in their life. Our students are the frontline workers who cared for all of us throughout the pandemic, working in childcare, nursing homes, meatpacking plants, farming. They are incredibly hardworking, often holding multiple jobs while raising their families and dealing with significant challenges like housing and food insecurity, incarceration, or they may be escaping violence in their home country. Whatever the barrier, ABE can help. An example is my student Amber. Her story is not uncommon. Amber is a single mother who had left school at the age of 17 to work full time in order to support her newborn daughter. She worked for a large retailer but didn't earn enough to make ends meet. She needed a promotion but lacked the high school credential that was required. So she worked hard and came to class and learned the algebra she needed to pass her test. Doing this, she was able to get the promotion and increase her paycheck by 30%. This allowed her for the first time in her life to afford an apartment and to, not to be sleeping on her friend's couch anymore to provide her daughter with a stable, safe home. And today she's planning on attending community college. So you can see that just with these few simple interventions, she was able to change the direction of her life and that of her daughter's. This is how ABE works. So today I'm asking you to help us continue this critical work by tying adult based city education increases to increases in K-12 funding, which would allow us to keep pace with rising costs, and by raising the rate cap, which disproportionately affects greater Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Scrabo. And next we have Aaron um, Goods. And if we can state his full name for the record and begin. Yes, thank you very much. Why don't we have, um, or even move the microphone on the other side? How's that? Yeah. Oh, did it all of a sudden start working? Okay. We must be nimble at the legislature. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair and everyone here today. My name is Erin Gutsky, and I am the Executive Director for Think Self, which is based here in St. Paul. We are a community-based consortium for deaf adults, as well as deaf-blind, deaf-disabled, hard of hearing, and those individuals who are late to deafened. But we do serve the entire state of Minnesota. There's long been a need for our program to grow and expand our capacity, especially in the rural areas. We need to meet the needs of working adults and their families and their responsibilities. We provide classes, resources, and support for people who are looking to grow their language skills, their education, and employment skills. 
Our learners come from a wide range of educational backgrounds, geographic backgrounds, as well as language and linguistic backgrounds. Some of them have never stepped foot in a classroom in their life. While others do have a college degree, but they come back for uh, tutoring and other needs as they are pursuing their skills. We offer a second chance at learning for people who have faced serious trauma and barriers and challenges in their life, including war, racism, oppression, abuse, and systemic marginalization. <coughs> Think Self also creates jobs and advancement opportunities for members of the community that we serve. Most of our staff also self-identifies as, as adult learners. And they receive advanced professional development as well as networking opportunities. Uh, many interns, many were interns and staff, they've carried on the mission of equitable access through roles at Gallaudet University, the state of Minnesota in government roles, and at our sibling anti-violence agencies. In addition to that, our past learners are, are now our current teachers showcasing exactly what happens when education is made available to deaf adult learners. This is how we build strong foundations for individuals. We provide communication and literacy skills to make sure that individuals have full participation in their community, pursue their goals, and are able to lead fulfilling lives. We are in a language immersion program. Uh, the learners they come into a welcoming, accessible, language-rich environment, which leads to improved communication skills and increased cultural awareness, career opportunities, and personal growth. Uh, economic empowerment. Achievement in adult education improves the socioeconomic status of learners and their children. Improved language <coughs> skills allow our learners and their families to build generational wealth and enjoy a higher standard of living. And health outcomes, literacy skills allow our learners to navigate complex healthcare systems, understand health information shared with them by medical staff, and take steps to keep themselves and their families healthy and safe. So why is a deaf-specific adult basic education program important? As you can see, I'm using sign language here today. Learning ASL allows people who have experienced language deprivation to express themselves, establish and work toward their goals, and build their support system. For people with hearing loss, ASL is a natural language, acquired much more easily than spoken language, and allows for access to a community of over one million people in the US who use ASL as their primary language in the workplace, home, and beyond. We are a language immersion program. Deaf adults can develop their language skills through hands-on experience. Our program allows learners to spend time with fluent sign language users, attend language-rich classes such as ours, and participate in social outings that require the use of sign language. We give one-on-one -on -one instruction, and people who have experienced language deprivation benefit from an intentional introduction to language, where a teacher or tutor can give them one-on-one -on -one support, feedback, and help them develop their skills. We provide experiences as well. Often our school is their first formal education. These experiences show how to communicate effectively in different social settings, build relationships with others, and express their emotions. So in summary, Think Self, Deaf Adult Basic Education, is a leader in this country and in Minnesota. We are actually the only program that is established specifically by and for the deaf community. There are no others in the country like that, so please continue to invest in us, and please support Senate, Senate File 1855 so that Think Self can continue to expand and better serve, especially those in greater Minnesota. We don't have the resources as it is to provide more access to language immersion programs for those who live in more rural areas. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Gutsky. Thank you. Uh, and that concludes our testifiers. Members, do we have any questions or thoughts? Senator Zhang, any final uh, words then? 
thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. Uh, it's a great bill. Uh, talking with some of the folks that have been advocating for this bill, we've done this for a couple of years, um, but hopefully we could get it passed this year. Uh, hearing the stories as, as shared, um, some of the folks that are in that utilizes this programming are what defines um, the greatness of America. You know, we're a country that even when some things happen, you know, we don't give up, we revive, we revamp, and uh, the determination of some of these family, uh, Minnesota, Minnesota families has, has shown uh, the grit and grind of everyday silent work, work that goes into uh, rebuilding and powering our uh, state for the future. And so I, I urge your support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you to all the testifiers that came and shared all the incredible that work that you're doing that affects not just our adult learners, but um, their families and their communities as well. So with that, uh, Senator Maquade renews her motion to move Senate File 1855 um, for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Next, we have Senator Bolden. And Senator Bolden's testifiers are both uh, remote, so any members that have um, your Zoom open, you um, are welcome to put your screen back on. Senator Swadzinski, would you um, like to move Senate File 255 for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill? So moved. Thank you so much. Senator Bolden, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members, for hearing this bill this morning. Um, this would allocate resources for an excellent program. Uh, the Alliance of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Latin Americans, or ACLA, is a nonprofit organization created to provide support to migrant and immigrant children that were experiencing the lowest levels of educational attainment and enrichment activities. ACLA's mission is to empower Hispanics to participate in enriching the quality of life in the Rochester area through educational opportunities, civic engagement, community-wide partnerships and collaboration, cultural exchange, capacity building within the Hispanic community. The Juntos Club has been a tutoring program that reaches out to our diverse communities in the Rochester area for the last 19 years. The goal for this program is to create an educational platform that provides access to information, resources, health advocacy, and opportunities to Hispanic children, youth, and families. And to share more about this, um, we do have some testifiers, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and so I'm looking here and I see uh, Miriam Goodson. If you would like to please state your name for the record and then you may begin. Good morning and thank you very much everybody for this opportunity. Um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Miriam Lopez Daumas Goodson and I have been part of ACLA. I'm a co-founder of this organization that we've been working for the 19 past years. So we are very glad to tell you that um, we have been part of the lives of so many students and families that they have, I, I have seen their growth and I have seen that giving back to the community. So it's important to share that with you, we have not done this alone. We have a lot of partners. We have a lot of collaborations with, um, that, to name few, of course, the Rochester Public Schools, the Rochester Community and Technical Colleges, Mayo Clinic. We do a lot of community-based participatory re research. So we have been building capacity. So we are at that point that we believe we right now in the past, we have served hundreds of families, imagine in 19 years, and we have been able to survive. But after COVID-19, really, once the pandemic hit, we had to temporarily suspend our services. But unfortunately, this left a lot of families and students out of participating with the Juntos program. And we have seen the drop. The drop has been just uh, devastating. The, the graduation rates, the scores in the MCAs, and we want to help, we want to help. But in top of that, we have the new um, 
law that is coming into practice that the people can drive. They can bring their children. In the past, I just to do all the driving, picking up a lot of students to bring to the program. But right now, it's like parents can bring the kids. So we're going to have a huge growth. A lot of people want to be part of this program. And so that's why I'm here, to ask you and to thank you for your time and give us this opportunity to grow and provide all these adult services. We are addressing the mental health. We're addressing uh, navigating the system. Um, we're there to be one-on-one -on -one helping adults to reach for their dreams and their children's dreams. Um, we want to um, be able to invest on our children. And please, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Um, Goodson. We appreciate you coming and uh, sharing your thoughts on this, this program. Uh, I do have a Gloria Torres Herbeck on our list. Nope, she's not available, but looks like we have an in-person uh, substitute. So if you'd like to state your name for the record, and then you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, I, um, Madam Chair and members. Thank you so much. Um, I am, uh, it's an honor for me to be here with you. My name is Rebecca Sadarsky. I am a former president for the Alliance of Chicano Hispanics and Latin Americans um, and a member of the board of directors right now and a co-chair for the Civic Engagement and Economic Development Committee. Um, ACLA's organization was created because of the educational disparities among Hispanic students and families in Minnesota. Um, ACLA's board is made of 11 dedicated Latino leaders uh, ready to increase the impact within Southern Minnesota and expand uh, services to students and families in need. Throughout ACLA's educational reach, we have witnessed many of our students complete their high, higher education dreams and are now contributing members of our communities. Currently, uh, Rochester's population includes roughly 6% of, uh, of our Latino community uh, are min uh, in, min in Minnesota. So many of our families and children are disconnected from traditional support systems, and this funding will allow us to reach them in a culturally appropriate way. At this time, we are uh, a uh, approximately, uh, there are approximately 35 Hispanic Latino children that are not registered for kindergarten in the Rochester Public School System and uh, need those navigation system, uh, services to be ready in the fall. As you all know, this will affect the children's educational outcomes in the long run. I also would like to share someone who sent us a video of his testimony as a member uh, that was in Juntos Club and now is, is uh, a contributed member. And, and so I would like to share, I will just put it in the mic, uh, his testimony, if that's okay with you. His name is Enrique Zavala. Go ahead. He's Enrique Zavala Rocha. And I'm currently a member of the Alliance of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Latin Americans, also known as ACLA, and a member of Juntos program. I moved to the U.S. at a very young age, along with my parents and younger sister. Like many members of the Latino community, my family experienced the hardships of navigating the American education system through language and cultural barriers. At church, my parents found out about the Juntos program, a math tutoring program offered by ACLA, it was a free and simple process to join, unlike other programs in the area. In Juntos, I found a sense of openness and acceptance that I had not experienced in a classroom before. There were other children who looked like me, who spoke like me, and who had similar experiences like I did. For once, I was surrounded by a larger community of children my age who knew what it was like to be an outsider. Juntos, offered a sense of pride in my identity. It was also where I met leaders in the Latino community that would become and continue to be my role models. I became a mentor at the Juntos program and also became involved in other programs that ACLA had to offer. 
Fast forward 19 years, and I am now a proud member of the ACLA board and am taking an active role to shape the Rochester community into something better. Juntos is a unique program that fosters a sense of community, nurtures education, and builds pride. It connects children with leaders in the community and provides role models like it did with me. That is his testimony, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Members, uh, I think that concludes our, our testifiers. Yeah, okay. Members, any questions or comments? I do have a question. Um, I know that uh, our um, remote speaker came from Rochester and our last speaker mentioned Rochester. Is this a program that is statewide? And no, thank you for your question, Madam Chair. No, this is uh, particular for the city of Rochester. We've been based there for the past 19 years in, in Rochester. But we have served uh, the surrounding communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Any, anyone else? Well, thank you for your hard work. Um, the fact that you've been able to hold this together for 19 years and provide those kind of resources and obviously um, has made a big difference in your community. And when we listen to the last testifier and the fact that his family was able to access it, he was able to um, get the benefits of it and then become a mentor and participant himself really speaks to the program. So thank you so much. Uh, Senator Bolden, any last words? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, um, again, I thanks to the testifiers. This is a, an excellent, uh, proven, and needed uh, program in our community, so I would appreciate your support. With that, uh, Senator Swidzinski <laughs> renews his motion to uh, include Senate File 2255, uh, possible inclusion in our omnibus bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, on our agenda, we had one more bill, uh, Senate File 1047, but unfortunately, Senator Muhammad isn't able to join us this morning, so we're going to um, lay that over and, well, not lay it over, but we will bring it back uh, uh, possibly tomorrow or one other day when we have that opportunity for her to speak to this bill. And so just get ready. We have one more uh, day of of hearings tomorrow. And um, with that, we are adjourned.